Hello and welcome. Let me get this cushion out from under my butt. <sighs> That's better. Yeah, as you can see from the screen, we're going to be discussing one of the longest lasting mysteries. in history here especially since world war ii since this itself took place in december of 1945 not long after world war ii had ended so yeah the disappearance of flight 19 Let's go ahead and look at some other stuff first here. We have from the Naval History and Heritage Command website an article on the loss of Flight 19. If you, yeah, shortly after 2 p.m. on December the 5th, 1945, five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers departed U.S. Naval Air Station, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for a routine navigational training flight with Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor acting as the flight's leader. So yeah, Taylor himself they say was a seasoned naval aviator with some 2,500 flying hours and multiple World War II combat hour or tours in the Pacific. Like I said, World War II had ended just months earlier. We were still early into the American Air Force. You got to remember, uh, early flight was on uh, airplane flight. Let me correct myself. Uh, airplane flight was early into the 1900s. So, yeah. The um, actual flying, you know, was still fairly new during World War One. I. I think. Uh, the Wright Brothers flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina was 1907. And then World War I, 1914 to 1918. So, it was fairly new in World War I. We were just getting the hang of flight by the time World War II came around. It's still early, but we're actually getting better with the airplanes. So, yeah. There's still a lot that is missing that we have nowadays as far as systems that we depend on when we fly but we're getting there we're, we're learning a lot about what we need now with that said December 1945 
flying from the Naval Air Base in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which I believe is on the western side of the state. Uh, Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, in that area. But, they're last reported being seen on the eastern side. Yeah. What happened? As it said, Taylor was thought to be a very seasoned pilot. He had over 2,500 hours flying. Fairly experienced. Um, to be a flight commander, he'd fought, been in several missions in World War II. So, yeah. Um, the group of aircraft dubbed Flight 19 were to execute navigation problem number one, which was to fly uh, to the east from Florida, from the Florida coast, conduct bombing runs in a place called Hens and Chickens Shoals, turn north, then proceed over Grand Bahama Island. So the flight's last log was to fly back to Fort uh, Naval, Naval Air Base. Um, Naval, Naval Air Station, Fort Lauderdale. The weather was projected to be relatively normal, except for a couple of shattered uh, showers. Uh, on the first leg of the run, of, of the flight, everything went as planned, as they dropped practice bombs without incident. The group began their turn north toward the Bahamas, or uh, toward Great Grand Bahama Island, uh, for the second leg of the journey. That's when the trouble began for Flight 19 at approximately 3:45 p.m. So, an hour and 45 minutes from whence they had left, Fort Lauderdale's flight tower received a message from Taylor, who reportedly sounded confused and worried. Cannot see land. We seem to be off course is what was caught as Taylor saying. What is your uh, position? Tower responds. Then there was a few moments of silence. Tower personnel peered out into the clear day in the direction where the planes were supposed to be operating, but there was no sign of them. We cannot be sure where we are. Repeat, cannot see land, the flight leader announces. So, yeah. You have these five bombers led by a pilot who had seen many hours of flight and flown in World War II the flight weather seemed like it should be good. He travels east from Fort Lauderdale across Florida into the Atlantic over the Hens and Chickens show. They complete the bombing practice run and they're heading north to Grand Bahama Island.
but they run into trouble. What's going on? What they cannot see land. They it's, he uh, the the lead pilot is like they say he seems confused. He seems troubled. They can't he can't tell exactly where they are. Which you get out in the ocean, away from the coast, it's going to get bad. Cause for a huge swath, all you're going to see is ocean. Now, Contact was lost for about 10 minutes, but when it resumed, it was not the voice of the flight leader. We can't find West. Everything is wrong. We can't be sure of any direction. Everything looks strange. Even the ocean. Then there was another delay, and when the tower personnel learned from intercepted transmissions that the flight leader had turned over his command to another pilot for unknown reasons. So that's the other voice that comes on. So there's a good chance the lead pilot didn't trust himself. He's like, I need you to contact the navigational tower. Let them know. But we're not sure. All, all we know was another pilot now had been issuing the transmission. After 20 minutes of radio silence. The new leader's voice transmitted to the tower, but it was trembling, bordering on hysteria. We can't tell where we are. Everything is... can't make out anything. We think we may be about 225 miles northeast of base. For a few moments, the pilot rambled incoherently before uttering the last words ever heard from Flight 19. It looks like we're entering white water. We're, we're completely lost. Within minutes, tower personnel scrambled two PBM Mariner flying boats carrying rescue equipment. They were headed for Flight 19's last known estimated position and after 10 minutes into the rescue flight they checked in with the tower but that was the last time one of the rescue planes transmitted back to Fort Lauderdale's flight operations. Now six aircraft with personnel had vanished for five days, Coast Guard, Navy, and Naval Aviation personnel searched extensively for more than 250,000 square miles of Atlantic and Gulf waters. But nothing was found. No aviators, wreckage, life raft, or even an oil slick. Nothing. The Navy launched an investigation into the incident, but nothing conclusive was found. Fourteen men were lost as a result of the Flight 19 tragedy. Thirteen more were lost from the PBM Mariner attempted rescue. So two planes sent out. Only one they lose track of. Did the other say anything? I mean, interesting. Interesting. And then we have from historyhub.history.gov.
So yeah, they'll give a lot of the same information. Now, do we have any information on that other PBM Mariner? Starting around 3 p.m., transmissions from the Lost Plains began to be received for the next three hours. Naval air stations listened to the growing confusion and frustration of the commanding pilot. Even then, the radio transmissions ended about 6.30 p.m. that evening with Lieutenant Taylor saying they might have to ditch at sea unless they found land and that the first plane goes below 10 gallons of fuel, then all will ditch together. So yeah, there, among the search and rescue units, were two PBM-5 Martin Mariners, large seaplanes from Naval Air Station, Banana River, Florida, that took off at 7.27 p.m. So remember, this is December, this is winter, so by this point in time, 7.27 p.m., you're looking at dark. So they're flying through the dark night trying a rescue. One of the PBM fives made a routine call at 730 and then was never heard from again. There is some evidence that the Mariner may have exploded in midair because there were reports from vessels at sea that the Mariner's patrol area saying they saw a fireball approximately around the time another ship lost radar contact with the plane. The U.S. Navy was baffled by the loss of both the Avengers and the Mariner, and so they investigated. Hmm. So, yeah. So, it may be... Okay. Interesting. Among the newly added series of digital, digitized records to the National Archives catalog is National Archives publication M1657, folder A17, Fort Lauderdale 5, TBM crash, December 5th, 1945, through PBM 1946. A single reel of microfilm that is part of the series subject files, 1945 to 1958, in the records of the Naval Districts and Shore Establishments Record Group 181, and they are a custody of the National Archives at Fort Worth, Texas. The microfilm series is a collection of materials that was eventually used in the Navy's Board of Investigation, including weather observations, the history of the aircraft and engine logs, a rough crash log, radio station logs, pre-flight forms, communications logs, incident reports, air and sea rescue plans, maps of the search area. Hmm. So, recent addition to the information, in addition to these records, there are related records on other series that have not been digitized in the custody of the National Archives at College Park, textual reference. In the World War II command files that are part of the records of the Chief Naval Operations Record Group 38, there is a file unit titled Shore Establishments, Jacksonville Naval Air Station Board of Investigation, 5 TBM Avengers, 7 December 1945. That includes a copy of the findings of the Board of Investigations. There is another copy 
of the Board of Investigation in file units type of command, training, Naval Air Advanced Training Command, Jacksonville, Florida, Board of Investigation into Missing TBMs and PBM pl Airplanes, December 7th, 1945, Parts 1 and 2. Hmm. So they've had new information made available. Although, of course, I'm sure the Navy already was aware of it. Um, in the casualty assistance branch, ships, stations, units, and incidents, casualty information records, in the records of the Bureau of Naval Personnel, there are casualty reports filed under the uh, Naval air station Fort Lauderdale and under Naval Air Station Banana River. Remember these are the location where they launched the flight from and then I think was Banana River where they launched the Avengers or was it just a tower where they got some of the inf transmissions from? I can't remember off the top of my head. But they're the two that have the most to do with this. Uh, the files include correspondence from the casualty assistance branch regarding the circumstances of the losses and any legal changes to their status. Part of this file addresses the crew's status as missing versus being declared dead. Interesting. Yeah, so Banana River is where they launched the Mariners from. Now, on the other side of the story, not only were trained personnel lost, but so were several planes. Yeah, five Avenger bombers and one Mariner. So... Yeah, uh, the accident reports for the craft can also can be located at the series titled General Correspondence 1943 to 45. In the records of the Bureau of Aeronautics, the five Avengers were filed under VTBM1 slash L11 hyphen 1, 1945. And the Mariner is filed under VPBM 5 slash L11 dash 1, 1945. These accident reports include a form report describing the circumstances and the loss of the aircraft, who was aboard at the time, additional information related to the search efforts and the general decision on who or what was to blame for the loss. In this particular case, a decision was made based on the evidence on hand, but deferred the final decision to the Board of Investigation to be held later. So, okay, we... Essentially, they've got a lot of supposition but no true definition on what happened themselves it looks like in addition to the records of the national archives there may be other relevant records dating to flight 19 that were created by local naval air stations and the regional naval district the records of the 7th Naval District in Florida and the Naval Air Stations that were involved in the incident are in the custody of the National Archives at Atlanta. An example of these records are in the central subject file, not 42 to 45. Oh, excuse me. Of the 7th Naval District. So it's talking a lot about the files themselves. 
where the information resides. Yeah. Okay. The loss of the planes in Flight 19 are, and the search plane PBM-5 and 45 with all new innovations of radar, J, or IFF, Identity Friend or Foe Transponders, and a myriad of equipment that was available to pilots and crew to help them survive a crash, stay afloat, and help searchers find them goes to show how big the ocean still is. Yeah, it at that point was really big and it's still huge. Six relatively small planes proved to be impossible to locate in churning waters of the Atlantic and in among the miles of shorelines of Florida, Grand Bahamas, and elsewhere. The loss of the planes and crew of Flight 19 remains a mystery to this day. So, yeah, they have a lot of information, a lot of documentation. But again, in the end, they don't know what happened. To the crew. Yeah. The Grumman TBM Avengers, they were bombers, five, fourteen men total. And then we have the one PBM Mariner rescue plane that disappeared as well. And again, this was just meant to be a training flight. So you're flying from Fort Lauderdale Naval air base air station you fly eastward over the designated reefs do the practice bomb runs and then you're meant to fly north to Grand Bahama Island and it's in that north flight that things seem to go awry. Everything is just... There's this confusion. And again, remember, you get so far out you and you can't see coastline anymore, it's just ocean. It's just water. You... If you let yourself get disoriented... You have little to trust but your instruments. There is no trusting your gut. <sighs> yeah. Talks about the three legs. Okay, here's a good look at what they were supposed to do. They had Fort Lauderdale there. I thought Fort Lauderdale was around here. I show. I'm serious. I thought it was up here with Tampa. This is like down here towards Miami, ain't it?
Fort. Gal. Spell it right for me. Max. Okay, so I was wrong. They've got it on the East Coast. I was, I was thinking it was shrink the map a bit, please. I was thinking it was over here with Tampa. Oh, St. Petersburg's what I'm thinking of, not Fort Lauderdale. My bad. So, okay, it is coming off the east coast of Florida. I was like, I know there's one that's with Tampa. I think it's Fort Lauderdale. No, no. it's St. Petersburg I was trying to think of. Okay. So, yeah. Never mind my rambling about where Fort Lauderdale is. <laughs> it's on the east coast here of Florida. So we travel eastward. They're meant to be over this section here doing their bombing runs and then head up here. So we're leaving the Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale. Okay, yeah, uh, there's where the bombing goes, and they go further out, as is planned, and the turn left, aka, in this instance, north. That was what was planned. Now, the problem is before they get here to turn left and end the exercise going westward so they could head back to base, something happens. Okay, 1750, so 550, if I'm remembering 24-hour clock time. Uh, radio triangulation establishes the flight's position to be within 50 nautical miles of their last reported course. So, apparently, they think it was around here when they were last transmitting. So, even though they weren't supposed to go that far. Something happened. And they ended up further north than was expected. The PBM Mariner leaves uh, Naval Air Station Banana River and then Mariner explodes. Just 23 minutes later. So yeah, Mariner leaves and they said they believe it explodes just a little off the coast here. As it was headed to try to search the area. 
So one of the Mariners, they believe, explodes in the air, fireball. They seem to have a lot of corroborating evidence that something happened for it to go boom. Because they lose it on radar. There's sightings of a fireball about the time they lose it on radar. So... Hmm. Yeah. Twenty one fifteen, so nine. I think that's right. Yeah, I think I think it's supposed to be nine fifteen PM. The tanker SS Gaines Mills reported it had observed flames from an apparent explosion leaping 100 feet high and burning for 10 minutes. So, that's when it reports it. Um, last known message from the Mariner was at 19.30, which would be 7.30 p.m. Again, remember, at this point, they're flying in the dark. So, things like a fireball and stuff like that is going to be seen clear. Or they're in the dark because it's gonna be it lights up everything. Uh, do, 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 do. the PBM could hold nine point eight three tons of aviation gasoline. Its flexible fuel lines had a noted tendency to get loose in rough conditions. And leak gasoline. And that is the most likely conclusion uh, for the Mariners' midair explosion. So, as far as the Mariner itself, it was just an unfortunate coincidence. Yeah, in the midst of trying to find and rescue the uh, airmen on the, that were part of the Avengers that had gone missing, they ended up exploding, losing. Losing all that were on aboard. Uh, so, yeah. 500 page Navy Board of Investigation report published a few months later made several observations. Flight leader Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor had mistakenly believed that the small islands he passed over were the Florida Keys that his flight was over the Gulf of Mexico and was heading northeast and could take them and that heading northeast would take them to Florida. So, yeah, the thought is that if you've ever seen Florida, at the bottom there is a chain of islands that does this little swing westward. The Florida Keys. And... He believed... The islands they were passing over was the Florida Keys. 
how they ended up southward and westward of Florida. It's baffling. But that's what they believe he was... He... he he mistaked as to what happened and thinking he was in the Gulf of Mexico in the Caribbean and everything that oh if he would turn northeast it would lead him back to Florida you make that maneuver out over the Atlantic You're just going to go further into the Atlantic. So, yeah. Um, it was determined that Taylor had passed over the Bahamas as scheduled. And he did, in fact, lead his flight to the northeast over the Atlantic. The report noted that some subordinate officers did likely know their approximate position as indicated by radio transmissions stating that flying west would result in reaching the mainland. As noted on the report, Taylor refused to change the radio training frequency to the search and rescue radio frequency. The training frequency was difficult to use because of interference from Cuban radio stations and also a radio carrier wave. Taylor was not at fault because the compasses stopped working and the loss of the mariner was attributed to an explosion. The port report was subsequently amended cause unknown by the Navy after Taylor's mother contended that the Navy was unfairly blaming her son for the loss of the five aircraft and 14 men when the Navy had neither the bodies nor the airplanes as evidence which is what makes this so tough to define because we still we still don't know. It is possible that Taylor overshot Gorda K, private island in the Bahamas, and instead reached another landmass in the southern. Abaco Islands. And they lie in the north of the Bahamas. Hmm. He then proceeded northwest as planned. He fully expected to find the Grand Bahama Island line in front of him as expected. Instead, he eventually saw a landmass to his right side, the northern part of Abaco Island. Believing that this landmass to his right was Grand Bahama Island and his compass was malfunctioning, he set a course to what he thought was southwest to head straight back to Fort Lauderdale. However, in reality, this changed his course farther northwest toward open ocean. Uh, to add to his confusion, it's believed he encountered a series of islands north of Abaco Island, which looked very similar to the Key West Island, which we talked about in the south, run off the south of Florida itself.
fiction the crew members that died as part of the flight so these are the planes pilot crew members two crew members pilot two crew members Pilot, two crew members, pilot, two crew members, pilot, one crew member. And then the uh, Mariner, I think it was, so. So, yeah. The this is one of those mysteries we don't know what really happened. This little stretch of islands right here. This is what I'm talking about. It's supposed to be the Florida Keys. So there it's thought he could be flying so far north and thought he was down here in the Gulf of Mexico. So, yeah. If he decided that his only choice then was to turn northeast and he was actually here, he's going this way. If that is indeed what happened. As the Navy supposes. Now, there are more paranormal proclamations of what could happen. Many say, oh, it's aliens. Oh, it's a time vortex. We don't... We... There are many things in this world we don't know, we don't understand. So we can't say that's not. But it's unlikely. <laughs> the most likely situation is what... I, I'd probably have to agree what the Navy thought. Now, we don't know what conditions the men were under, what stress, what other issues, medicines, drugs, other stressors in life. We, we don't know. That may have our, uh, uh, been affecting them as well. We, we just don't know. But this is one of those flights, though, this disappearances has been blamed on the Bermuda Triangle, which is supposed to be, um, I think, Miami. It goes out of ways, up, and back. So, yeah. Even though beyond this, some people have been like, it's part of the Bermuda Triangle. Again, by Occam's razor, what the Navy proposed is most likely what happened. So, yeah. I enjoy the paranormal, the weird, the unknown, but sometimes there are things that 
the most likely answer is not the one you may not you may not want to hear. Because the mysterious is fun. Let's let's be honest. But yeah. But yeah, as I said, our lead pilot likely was confused as to what was going on. Do we know if there was any influence of drugs or anything else? Again, we don't know. But it's very likely he became confused, questioned his own judgment. Yeah. It's unfortunately just a sad event. More than likely that Oh, what actually happened. But, this has already been a huge video, so we'll end this here. As always, whoop, educate by self, think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll be putting link, these links in the description box below the video. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.